I heard a real estate agent in my office earlier today say, I just want to know everything already. I want this learning curve to be over. To which I said, you're in the wrong business. Which is actually the coolest thing about this business is because you're always learning. If you're like me, your ambition is always outpacing your ability. And just about the time you have a black belt in something, you've got to take it off and put on a white belt. And that's okay. Which is why at the Worley Real Estate Network, we're so enthusiastic about creating an environment where it's not our responsibility to make you succeed, but the environment will both irritate you and inspire you until you succeed. In fact, this is a, a place where thousands of people have come to increase their financial wealth through real estate and real estate education. And that's what we do. We serve our clients at the very highest level, and there's a process that can be trained. It is an apprenticeship process. If I could imagine a hammer and an anvil and the clang, 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 that's what happens to human beings when they enter the Worley real estate arena. We do our best to help grow people and to help people become first world-class agents and then investor-friendly agents and then investor agents and then team leads and then investors themselves and quite possibly even real estate developers. Come alongside me at some of the earlier stages in my career. I've had the great privilege to interview lots of people and extract some nuggets from the things that they've done, but I wanted an opportunity to share with you some of the things, the challenges that I've overcome because I think they're significant especially if you're a real estate agent or you're an entrepreneur or you're an investor or you're somebody that just wants to get the most out of life. That's what this podcast is. And I actually, because of that, want to start adding some additional episodes in the future where I can talk about more of the ways that God has showed up in my business. I want to create a new channel, a new format. I'm going to be calling it I the Shepherd, which will be detailing the journey from shepherdship to kingship. I'm also going to be creating some curriculum around that and Moving forward, I'm also going to give some people the microphone. So Cocktails and Dreams you're going to see is going to become more of a fun forum. And then some of the more deeper conversations that I want to have with people as it pertains to leadership or the way God shows up in their life, we're going to see those showing up on a little bit of different channels. So get ready, Season 3 of Cocktails and Dreams. We're going to shake things up a little bit for you, and we want to hear from you more. So we want to hear some of the, the topics that you would like to hear about. If you have ideas or if you know somebody that just needs to be pushed out there who is just living um, a great life because they're enjoying the journey, regardless of um, what life is throwing at them, then we want to know them and we want to know you. So get ready for this weird episode of Cocktails and Dreams where I get interviewed by Brian the Cartoon. Stay tuned. I've never done a podcast with a cartoon before. Who are you? Who are you looking at? And your pupils are gigantic. I checked my settings, dude. This is how I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I don't. I don't. I'm okay with it. Okay, I'm, cool. Then we'll just stick with this cartoon me when we'll do this interview. All right. Yeah, now, I mean, it's a little weird, but it is definitely weird. But this is going to be a weird episode. It's it's, it's actually somehow refreshing. <laughs> maybe maybe even better. All right. Are we recording? We are. Yeah. Oh, well, I am uh, really, well, first of all, what we can say about who I am is I'm the uh, recluse that hides in his home office, does video and editing and, and graphic work for Jeremy Worley, Worley Real Estate Network. Sounds exciting. Yeah, it sounds super exciting. And I drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> well, um, to pay homage to Cocktails and Dreams... Um, I brought something special. It's What'd a bottle do? of Jameson Black Barrel uh, Triple Distilled Irish Whiskey. I, I don't like Irish whiskey, and um, I generally don't drink Jameson. Well, there you go. We're going to get canceled. Good job. Hold that, got, hold that up got, again. Yeah. Am I not allowed to show this on a podcast? I don't know. We'll find out. But yes. I love it. I think it looks good. This so is not Jer an endorsement. It's not an endorsement. Jeremy, I've known you now for how long? 25 years? 20 years at least? Yeah. You that's how old, that's how old you are. You and I played opposite each other in the play that I wrote for the community theater when I first moved. Listen, to we didn't play opposite anything. You directed a show that you ended up firing or, or somebody ended up quitting at the last minute and you had to go in and do the part. Yeah. So we hired a guy to play the main part because what I wanted to do as an author is I wanted to hire a director and hire a cast and sit back and see how it how it worked. Well, the guy who jumped in and played the main character 
quit like three days before the show was supposed to go on. So I had to jump in and do it. Everybody said, oh, you do it. It'll be easy. You wrote it. Yeah. But like, it wasn't. Write, write 200 pages of something and put it under your bed for two years and then try to remember what you wrote. You know? Yeah. You've just spent the last three weeks telling everybody what to do. You didn't have to actually get on stage and do anything at that point. And then like, bam, right before the performance, it was like, get on stage. It was nerve wracking. Salon Selectives was the name of it. It was. We ended up going with Salon Selectives. Well, the reason why I'm incognito is um, nothing nefarious. It's just I don't have as much guts as all of your other people that you put on these podcasts and stuff. And um, I'll tell you honestly, dude, I I have grown up with you in Branson. And I've also, uh, I remember a period of time when you were out in LA seeking your dreams and Uh, I remember when you started your family and you brought them back to Branson because that's where you wanted to raise them. And I've watched you from day, I mean, one of this real estate journey as it, as it would be, but I've also known you before that as a performer, as an actor, as a writer, um, as a great creator of content. Um, Something else that we've done that some people don't know is we actually wrote a comic book series together. That's true. We did. It almost ended our, not friendship, but it almost (laughs) ended our lives because we were going to, I mean, it's a frustrating process to be creators together, right? It is. Absolutely. I mean, we should tell that story sometime. No, but, um, but that's a, what was it? That was like a 200 page graphic novel that we created and we put out there into the world. And it's, I think it's still a beautiful story. I'd love to get a Netflix series of that made. The reason why I bring it up is because you are the kind of person that says, if you want to achieve something, you have to start putting one foot in front of the other. There is nothing for anybody that sits there and on their butt and goes, boy, I wish this would happen to me, or I wish this for me, or it's, it's, I mean, we're going to talk about prayer. We're going to talk about faith. We're going to talk about a lot of things, but putting one foot in front of the other after you ask is kind of your uh, special talent that I think a lot of people don't realize. It's just making a decision and being too embarrassed at the repercussions for failure, you know, and so I can't walk backwards. I've got to walk forwards. You know, you just learn, you figure out the way. Let's talk about failure. Let's talk about 2007, 2008. So you came back from California with your new family. Yeah. And um, you had a real estate, you, you'd gotten your real estate license. Well, I didn't come back in a super great state. You know, if I'm being honest, it was a massive shift in my overall identity. Because up until this point, I was a performer. I was on a business plan, a 10-year business plan. Well, what I, I didn't know it was a 10-year business plan. Um, the entertainment world is a 10-year business plan. I had put together a two-year business plan, and I hit all my goals in that two-year business plan. I had an agent by this time. I had a manager by this time. I had an independent film, and I had done a significant commercial on a major network at this time. And I was working towards those classes to get into Saturday Night Live. Yeah. So I had made it into the groundling school and made it through all the advanced classes, which is very, very difficult to do. Got to the point where basically I ran out of money. There was a two-year waiting list for the next class. And the mark, yeah, the market had started to shift. You know, back in back during that time when I was working a sales gig, I mean, I actually stumbled into uh, the real estate financing at that point in my career, and I was nailing it. I was, uh, you know, I loved the sales aspect of it. I loved, you know, putting on a character. It was perfect for me at that time because the biggest issue for me at that time in my life is that I was a slow-talking Midwesterner who has a bohemian brain, right? I don't have the analytical brain of a CPA, and I'm reading this eight, this 24-inch long rate sheet in like 0.341 font and trying to add, add – points like fractions of a percent of an interest rate based on the criteria that someone is telling me as fast as possible. Is it a condo? Like what is it a high rise? Is it, what's the credit score of the person? You know, how much reserve do they have? Do they have six months reserve or two months reserves? And each thing dings a credit score. Then you got to add and, and give a rate sheet to these, give a rate to these people that you could stand behind. And like these people are going to make $35,000. These mortgage brokers are making $35,000 a pop on these things. And I'm the slow talking Midwesterner that wasn't getting to the point fast enough for these people. And the only way for me to succeed at that sales career was to put on a character. Like people would hang up on me left and right. The rejection was just absolutely horrible. And and I do not do good with rejection at all. Like even today, it's bad. I've been through the worst rejection therapy recently. It's just awful. So I had to put on a character, almost like 
a sociopathic way. I put on a character in order to be able to talk to these people so that when they would hang up on me, I'd pick up on the phone and I'd be like, hey, babe, I wasn't done talking to you yet. Now, this and- is uh, let me let me ask you, this is L.A. This is mm-hmm. Southern California. Mm hmm. So the 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 Midwestern thing is for people that don't know is totally fish out of water in Southern California. Definitely. And everybody talks about the West Coast being kind of laid back and stuff, but when you're in the real estate business in 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 Southern California, it's fast. Crazy. Crazy fast. Yeah. I don't even know how to equate it to anything around here. I don't there's nothing like anything around here and yeah, I mean my clients were all over the they were all over the the country. But most of them were in LA and most of them gave a, sh- gave a crap, you know? Yeah. And we had to win them over and we did. You won them over by being aggressive and getting to know them by having a good personality. Your personality was the key to unlocking business. Yeah. You know? So when I moved back with my daughter and you're right, I mean. Did you bring Kelly too? Not just your daughter, right? Yeah. I brought Kelly back too. Okay. And, uh, but, it, you know, we brought our daughter back. And so we moved out to California with, you know, nothing. And we moved back with nothing, you know, except for an extra person. Um, but I had moved out, I had financed my creative endeavors by flipping two properties in my 20s, in my early 20s, while I was working for Silver Dollar City, making minimum wage, working all day in a hundred degree heat, um, dressed up in 1800s garb. I flipped one home and in six months made what I made all year working for Silver Dollar City. And then I did that again and moved out to California with a huge chunk of money and moved back with nothing. I literally spent it all on gas, groceries and rent and came back with my daughter because I wanted to be, I wanted her to be raised near her family because family is one of my greatest values. So yeah, we moved back and it was, sad because my sales career was doing really, really well. Like I was the first salesman in my training class to hit that 5 million mark where they give you an assistant. So I was the first one to get an assistant. You know, I was the only assistant, the guy that I was working for got in a massive car accident. So I inherited his $60 million pipeline as an underqualified person. So, and I managed it and actually grew it. I'm well equipped for things I have no idea how to do. And I don't know why, except for maybe it's the pioneer. If I had to describe myself as something, It'd be that I'm a pioneer. I love learning new things. But then once I learn it, I, I kind of get bored of it pretty easily, like flipping houses, like being yeah. a real estate agent and like being a real estate broker. And I keep wanting to grow and scale because I'm on a quest for the best not real estate knowledge. You know, I didn't know okay. I was on the quest for real estate knowledge. I was on the quest for a greater return on my time. And real estate gave me that. And every time I dug okay. that vein, right? No, it no, just, no. I found more and more gold. No, no, Jeremy. I'm going to slap you down for a minute. You're I'm going to, you were humble. Getting slapped down by a cartoon here. Yeah. You were <laughs> humble. You, let me just, let's just be, I mean, I, I believe all the things that you're saying, but coming back to Branson, Missouri, after Southern California, you were humbled. You had, you had, it wasn't that you were rejected because you were on a path to what you wanted to accomplish, but you didn't have the extra three years to wait around for that to happen. And you had a baby girl and a wife and you were like, I'm going back to Branson, Missouri to raise my kids. I'm this, I can't keep putting them through this in Southern California, even though you were doing well, it wasn't going to get you where you needed to go as far as being able to raise your family. And so you came back to Branson a little bit defeated. Wouldn't you say that to would be accurate? I started my real estate career at the worst possible time in my yeah. emotional journey. Like yeah. I was de- depressed. So that I brings was, us to 2007, 2008, right? Yeah. So I got my real estate license in 2006 while I was mourning the loss of this, you know, uh, entertainer identity. And I was putting on a new identity, uh, a real estate guy. And, you know, I still have that identity now. But at that time, I was in learning mode. And I spent 18 months. I got my license in December 2006. And the market was hot then. And it was rolling. And I was trying to do loans and I was doing real estate at the same time. It took describe, me six- describe Branson, Missouri at that time when the market was hot, 2006, going into 2007. Okay. So there were there have been no new condos built in Branson at the time since the 90s. Yeah. And so the 90s was this silent economic boom. Like it is the legacy of Branson, Missouri to boom. I mean, we all know the story, Harold Beldwright, um, 
wrote the story, The Shepherd of the Hills, and that was Branson's first boom. The next boom was the 60 Minutes story in the 80s. And it was, this is America's best kept secret. And then boom, it exploded. And that's where all the condos came from in the 90s. Nothing new had been built. Branson um, had become a large retirement destination for people. And people were coming here and buying up second homes like crazy. And there was absolutely no inventory. Seven so, to eight million people a year are showing up in a town that has a population of, at the time, 30 200 people. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Just to give context for people out there that aren't from Branson, you know, yeah. I mean, like if you think of a town in your city that's got 3,200 people, that is a small town, right? It and is. Seven, seven to eight million people are pulling into town, staying in hotels, going to music shows, going to attractions. Jeremy Worley comes back with his wife and his baby daughter, sets up shop or starts getting into the real estate game at that moment, 2007. I didn't have the money to buy a house when I moved back. I think I got the last 80-20 loan that they ever issued on the market. That's where you get an 80% first loan and a 20% second loan. My first loan was at 7%. My second loan was at 12%. I did a 100% loan and the goal was to do nightly rentals on those, except I didn't realize that you couldn't do nightly rentals on those when I bought it. Um, that sucked because then I had to go and do long-term rental on it until I figured out a few years later that... I could do nightly rentals on it. When I asked the HOA if I could do nightly rentals on it, they said no. And then there was other people doing nightly rentals out there. And the whole time I was in judgment of them. Like, oh, well, pff, they're doing it wrong. They shouldn't be doing it. Look at those people. They're not rule followers. Where did the term nightly rental come from in your life? Did, where, did you see that in the Southern California market? Or was that just something you were dis discovering in Branson? I have no idea, Brian. I, I All I know is that I knew I was supposed to do nightly rentals when I moved back to Branson. Kelly and I both knew it. We looked at each other and, and I didn't know anything about it. Well, here's the thing. The reason why I bring it up is 2007, I'm going to go on a limb and say that the term vacation rental or nightly rental, we didn't have, I mean, I know that it did exist in the country, but as far as Branson goes, there weren't. The, the only thing I could equate it to would be um, bed and breakfast down in Eureka Springs. That was Night, the, Nightly rentals existed, but the term vacation rental didn't exist. Well, that's and what I'm saying. Rentals, yeah. Nightly rentals, for the most part, were managed by on-site property managers that charged 50% management fee because there was no internet to speak of. There was these operated resorts, whether by family operated or corporation operated, and people would come back for year after year to the same resorts, or they would look up where to stay. The on-site property management company would advertise you'd stay there as an owner. You could only stay in your property two weeks out of the year, and you would pay a 50% management fee plus fees to these management companies, these on-site management companies that would gouge people. So when the vacation rental world became available and, and, and VRBO, which was a small uh, mom and pop website at that time, hit the market, people for the first time had the freedom to move away from these horrible management fees and they could finally buy a property and communicate with other people that wanted to stay in it. And at that time, it was our vacation homes. It was my privilege to be able to share this home with you. And the guests were like, thank you so much for letting me stay in your home. And of course, now it's been commoditized and it's, you know, the customer is always right kind of thing. And and the OTAs like AirDNA have become very traveler centric and guest centric, which makes me want to vomit. Yep, Let me back sorry. you up just a yep. little bit. Yeah, back her up. Uh, the nightly rental market, would you say that Branson, Missouri's nightly rental or vacation rental market really springboarded off of that crazy condominium boom that we had in Branson in the 90s? Yeah, but I would say nightly rentals took off in the Branson area due to developers finding pathways for individual real estate investors to buy their product at pre-construction prices. So this is getting in the weeds a little bit, but it's very historical to Branson and a lot of other second home destinations. So developers and second home destinations would contract with real estate gurus. And in this case, a guy's name was Marshall Reddick. Um, a lot of people heard of Marshall Reddick. Well, there's a developer in Branson that- Wait a minute. I thought you said we weren't going to say any names in this podcast. Did I? No, I mean, there's 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 names I don't want you to say. Okay. Just, Marsh, Marshall Reddick. I don't recognize that name. Marshall Reddick is just a real estate guru that helped a lot of investors make a lot of money. And what had happened was, is there was some unscrupulous real estate developers that built inventory in Branson, lots of inventory. And basically what they did is they sold it 
to investors on large presentations. So they would hire somebody that would go travel to California, give a presentation, and that presentation would be, look how much money you could make off of these nightly rentals and brands. And by the way, we're going to manage it for you. And people are like, yep, passive income. Here you go. Hundred grand. And they're, and they're making 50% per night on those nightly rentals. Not so much. They were charging a reasonable fee. They were making their money off of the development sales. The management company was never designed to succeed. And that's what the big problem was. Okay. So because the management company wasn't scaled, what happened was, is that they could only manage a certain number of properties. So, but they continued to sell to other investors. So what they had to do to the old investors that they sold two years ago is go back to them and say, you know what? We're not going to manage these anymore. So here you go. You can manage it yourself. And all the new people were like, we're going to manage your property. And it was the same spiel and shtick every this two is very, years. This is, might be in the weeds, dude, but this is very interesting stuff that you're talking about right now. Well, what happened was, is all of those people, this all happened right around 07, 08. What happened was, is all the people that had bought that inventory, they let it go. They were busy professionals. These are people that were at seminars, ready to invest in real estate for passive income. And now all of a sudden, somebody hands it back to them and says, you have to manage this. And Airbnb didn't exist at that time. And nobody had heard of VRBO. Yeah. So they let them go back to the bank. And so I was one of the first people on the scene to realize that this should not be happening. There's no way in hell a short-term rental should ever go into foreclosure because the traveler need for this type of inventory is so high. In fact, I was able to stop a few people at that time from going into foreclosure. I was like, dude, trust me, buy $14,000 worth of furniture and put your property on this platform, take some photos. I helped a lot of people avoid foreclosure in, in 2008 and 2009 by just telling them to do that. And, and at this time, I was just learning. I was reading books. I was, there was only two books written on short-term rentals. I was the guy that wrote the third book. There was only two books written and there was no platform for it. When I'm selling short-term rentals, they, I had to lie to people and people have heard this before, but I had to tell them that the property was, you know, only did 25,000 a year instead of 35,000 a year because they didn't believe how much money you could make off of these things. And so- so this is 2007 uh, going into 2008. Now, what happened in 2008? So in 08, the market crashed completely. You know, I'd only closed four deals that year. I had taken on a part-time job working at a timeshare company, you know, because it was the only place that would, you know, hire somebody if they had, you know, a third eye growing out of their forehead. I mean, they'll hire anybody. So I just went in there and I made my minimum wage working there. Kelly had taken on a part-time job. And we both lost our jobs, got laid off from our jobs. And all I had was my real estate career. And I'd only closed four deals in 2008. So I'd made like, what, $12,000 that year. So I had this credit card that I took out, a Bank of America credit card. And it was, I forget the interest rate, but I put everything that I couldn't afford on that credit card. And it took me three years to pay off. And I called that 2008. And it wasn't fun. But during that time, there was a new development that was nightly rental approved in Branson. It was called Branson Canyon. And I made a deal with the developers at that time because they had a problem. The problem that those developers had was that real the, the business model between a developer and a real estate agent were not the same. And they're still not the same to this day. Now, let and me ask you a question about Branson Canyon. Do you feel that they kind of, before they hired you, did they have the same business plan as what we talked a year or two before that, that kind of set this thing of overselling uh, inventory? No, they had an idea to, to approve individual detached condos for nightly rental. So mm -hmm. homes, actual homes for rent. Okay, okay. You know, by owner, which was cool because you got a little bit of yard, you got a, a deck, you got some privacy. So a home can, it feels different than a condo. You know, you don't have people walking up and down all over. You don't have, you know, things hanging, towels hanging off a balcony. A home was different. So, and Branson Canyon was a beautiful development. It was small footprint, um, high end scaled homes. Yeah, it's um, it's funny how it's it's very interesting how the trajectory of a development like Branson Canyon has completely changed because it went from being the only girl on the block to being the girl nobody wanted to being the girl people really want now again because. Now yeah. yeah. And when you came into it, it was kind of uh it was kind of in between the new girl on the block and the girl that nobody wanted because the the market was crashing. It's still. I mean, we're into 2008 and people aren't buying uh five, six bedroom, three level homes at that moment, right? Nobody knew who the girl was or what or how beautiful she really was. 
when okay. I took over. So I was the guy that was the advocate for the girl. And I was like, this, this, this is sounding thing. very misogynistic. We need to get off the girl. <laughs> I, I get what you're saying though, but Branson Canyon at that time had, it was a, a three or four phase development. I think you guys were on to phase two at that point, right? We were still in phase one. Phase one. Okay. But it had a beautiful setting, had a wonderful pool. It had the clubhouse and then it was surrounded by, I don't know how many units, but probably 20 or 30 very well developed houses. It was the first place where you could get anywhere from a two to six bedroom home, where you could have a little bit of a yard, where you had a maintenance free product, but it was a home. So you had a home, but it was maintenance free. You had a high speed internet. You had an outdoor pool and a clubhouse to be able to rent for small family gatherings, which was perfect for people renting one or two homes in the area. And we discovered during that time that the two bedroom homes didn't make as much money on the vacation rental and the more bedrooms was the name of the game. So we went from selling two bedrooms to nine bedroom properties in the course of a year and a half. Based but on how, how did that happen in the crash of a market? Because you were basically selling the vacation rental market at that point. You weren't selling investors into buying these houses. You were selling them on how bulletproof the vacation rental market was in Branson at that time, right? No, I was under pressure from the developers to sell as many homes as I possibly could. Okay. And, <laughs> but through and, that, you developed this understanding of what was sellable versus trying to sell a five or six bedroom home to even an investor at that point. People didn't understand the power of short-term rental at that point in time. Yeah. And I was an unknown voice, uh, passionately shouting uh, in the dark. Um, bigger pockets didn't exist. I didn't find bigger pockets. They didn't find me. They found other people. And, you know, those people went on to, you know, pseudo stardom in that world. I've been a low key OG in this industry for a long time. And I learned the hard way on how to sell these things. And I went and I trained investors for free just because I needed the real estate commission. So I went in and bought these myself. And I eventually learned how to do that, how to buy real estate with no money and to make deals. The developers liked me. So they gave me a big discount on the stuff that I wanted to buy. So that's how I started earning equity. I just went into business with family members and started my short-term rental journey that way. Okay, let's pin that because that's important. Because I think a major transition happened in your life at that moment. You you went you went from being a uh, and I hate to use the word salesperson, but you you understood what you were telling investors and how valuable it was, and you saw people succeeding in that market, and you really did go all in, even with your family to with your with your extended family to get a. A, a vacation rental property. I saw people in their late 40s, early 50s, stumbling on a real estate asset class that was poised to earn them a lot of money. And I watched them invest in real estate over and over again until it irritated me to the point that I could do it. And I was in my early 30s. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I need people to understand where you're at in your life at that moment. When you guys took out that loan and bought that first you know, investment property. It wasn't an easy decision for you guys to make, was it? No. The first time I did it, I didn't even take out a loan. I mean, I took out a loan, but I didn't use my own money. I kept hearing people say at seminars, you don't need to invest in real estate or you don't need your own money to invest in real estate. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense to me. People kept saying it and like laughing. And I'm like, just tell me, you know, how to do this. And nobody would. And so I just decided to do it. I made an offer on a two bedroom, two bath condo. It was $52,000 for this condo. Called up, I called up my grandpa and I said, can you give me a 20% loan? You know, so what is that? What's 20% of $52,000? $10,400. I asked my grandpa for a 20% down payment, put it in the bank, $10,400. I said, I'll pay you 6% on that. Um, how do you want your payments? He said, monthly. I said, great. It was like $59 a month that I had to pay him on that loan. And I told him I'd pay him all back in two years with a balloon payment. I went to the bank and I said, yep, I got a down payment over here. They said, great, we'll give you 80%. They gave me the rest at like 6% and um, it was like five and a half percent. And so I borrowed all that money and then I went and got a Lowe's credit card and I put all the countertops and all the repairs and paint and everything on that. And um, any contractors I paid with the credit card. And so I literally used none of my own money and my cash flow that year at the end of the year was $6,000. So I made $6,000 on zero of my own dollars. That was an infinite return. And I realized that this is just math. I'm trying to be too creative here. This is just math. But where is you and Kelly's life at that moment? I think it's important for uh, people getting into real estate, new realtors that are struggling 
new investor, or people that want to get into this, that want to become investors, I think it's important for them to understand what you just said and knowing where your guys' life was at the time. You're, are you renting or do you own your own home at that time? Kelly is working a retail job to yeah. try to give us the steady Freddie income that we can because real estate was so up and down at the time. Yeah. Um, so Kelly was my first private equity investor in my real estate career. Just to put a button on that story. So I made a deal with Branson Canyon during that, during the market crash. I said, I'll work for you guys as a salary. Like I went and I made a deal. I had to make my own way in the world. And so when everybody was losing their jobs, when all the real estate agents from the 70s and 80s were losing their houses because they couldn't hustle. They didn't know how to do it. They were so used to walk-ins coming in. I watched them all lose their houses. And I said to myself, I'm, I'm not going to buy into the mentality that the sky is falling here. So I'm, I went and I made a deal with these developers. And I said, I understand your problem. Your business plan is that you need to sell your inventory. A realtor's business plan is to get listings. So realtors were using the developers advertising to get listings of their own. In fact, they, when people would walk in and the developer would pay money for, to get leads, to get the visits on the property, I watched them do it. Those real estate agents would hand them other listings. And I told them, I said, I will not do that. I said, I'm going to sell your property from nine to five. And if I'm going to do any business outside of here, it'll be on my own time. And they said, deal, deal. I got a salary and I knew I, and I, and I got a small commission for every home that I sold. I screwed myself out of so much money in the first year because I turned out to be an animal. I figured out how to sell those properties. And in fact, two years later, I renegotiated my contract. All the people that were advisors in my life told me not to do it, but there was so much money left on the table. I said, guys, I said, I got to renegotiate this contract here because I need some of this commission. And so I was able to build in some like three, $4,000 bonuses, you know, scaling bonuses. And then ultimately the, those developers and I fell out of love for each other. And this is just a, a fact. Most real estate agents don't realize this. But you can only really have a great relationship with a developer for one to five years. Um, it's really hard to, for a real estate agent to have a relationship with a developer for longer than that. And there's a lot of reasons to it, but it all boils down to this. Basically, when things are going bad, the developer blames the real estate agent and there's no good way except the real estate agent isn't good. And when things are going good, it's all the developer's idea. Their real estate agent never gets credit for those ideas. So it's really hard for those relationships to stay in place long. But so mine came to an end and it came to a mutually you know, positive end. I continued to sell out there for a long time, but I had just opened up my own brokerage at this time. Which was... And yeah, we, we reskinned it to Worley & Associates, but uh, we debuted as the community real estate group because I, I wanted to take a budget and give back to my community every quarter. We actually do, did. We did. We charitably gave to our community and so into needs of our community and still do. But at that time, that was the main focus. But at this point, you have your own vacation rental property that you and Kelly are managing. No, my grandpa had purchased one out there at Branson Canyon and Kelly and I agreed to manage it. And that's how we got management and, and cleaning janitorial experience. But you have a condo that you guys bought prior to that. No, we kept a long-term rental in there uh, as long as we could. I really appreciated the deal that I made with Branson Canyon. There was no, there was no better upbringing for me than working for those three investors. Those were three retired Accenture partners who in some crazy way had taken me under their wing. And I learned from those guys so much about business, about marketing, about real estate development. And I committed to them and I honored all of my commitments to them um, until I realized, until I didn't feel valued anymore. And at that point, I decided to go my own way. I, at that point, I decided to give up 60% of my income for an unknown number. At that point in my life, uh, I felt God telling me, Branson Canyon is not your provider. You know, he, then he told me the name of my immediate supervisor, and he said, that person is not your provider. I am your provider. And go do with 20% of your time. You know, I was making just as much on 20% of my time as I was at Branson Canyon. And he just said, have faith. And the first thing that happened when I started Worley & Associates, you had asked me about the community real estate group. I rebranded it to Worley & Associates when I moved to Keller Williams. Yes, I did go to Keller Williams because at that point I had brought on a team member and I felt responsible for the success of that team member. And I needed tools, training, and technology or what I thought a company would provide that. 
I wanted mentorship. I wanted somebody to pour into me because I was pouring into others all the time. And that didn't happen. I think Keller Williams is a phenomenal organization. My particular market center, I didn't match up with. And it's not them. It's not me. It's just it wasn't a fit. But I felt responsible. And I, but I did learn some structural things within that organization that were great. It's just like I learned when I was a waiter at the Olive Garden. They had a very excellent corporate style of training waiters. You know, you follow that training style, you can train good agents. I learned at the Olive Garden and at Keller Williams that systems actually work. I didn't start any systems. I just, I was just a guy who was very busy and I needed an apprentice. And I was like, I don't have time to train you. Just watch what I do and just listen to me. That's not a great system. That's not a scalable system, but that's what I did at the time. I watched these other companies build these systems, but I never actually built them myself until I got to the point where I had to, when I had 30 or 40 agents and I had to start implementing systems. But because I had experience at corporations with systems, I just knew, aha, this is the time that I needed to implement them. Was it hard for the creative person, the 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 writer, the actor, the performer? Because a lot of your life at this point is performing at being a salesperson in Southern California or performing and I don't mean that in a bad way or a derogatory way, but was it hard for you to transition from the, I got control of this, I can make the speech work to transform into a leader of other people through systems? I, I wouldn't say it was hard. I would just say that it wasn't, it was just born out of necessity because I'm just swamped. Basically it was born out of frustration. So at that time in my life, I started carrying a journal and I started calling it my frustration journal. And everything that started frustrating me, I would write it down and then I knew what to go back and build a system on. So I went back and everything that was frustrating me, I created a system and then those became the systems that we still use today in the business. So leadership, you came out of Keller Williams, um, you had Worley Real Estate, uh, Worley and Associates, and you wanted to create a fiercely independent brokerage. Yeah, Branson was in need of an independent brokerage at that time. So the only independent brokerage had just gone into a franchise and there was no really great independent brokerage at that time. And I'm, you know, Kermit the Frog. Nobody wants to go do business with Kermit the Frog. They're like, who's this guy doing the Muppet show, showing up on Sesame Street, trying to like get my business. This guy's like literally hangs out with a bunch of misfits. People didn't understand us, but I was hanging out with a bunch of people that just wanted to make a ton of money in real estate as an investor. They wanted to serve investors when no one was serving that community. No one was serving the short-term rental community. In fact, nobody even knew what it was. Nobody cared. They just thought I was weird. They thought this guy's either eccentric or he's an introvert or whatever, but I didn't care. I had tons of work to do and I had very little time for social engagements and I'm trying to grow my business serve these agents that are starting to come faster and faster and faster now. So I, I'm a non-competing broker. I am not transactional. I am literally helping people with transactions. And every year that transaction size is doubling, 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 doubling. And also let's not forget, you have a book that you have produced at this point. Well, and prior, prior to the book, I had, um, I wanted to anchor back to something we talked about before, which was this sure. two bedroom, two bath condo okay. that I was investing in. We, my grandpa had just sold his Branson Canyon properties. So we were now, uh, he was now my private equity investor. I was growing this business in the way I just described while trying to invest in real estate at the same time. There's like no time for all of this, but you just have to make time. Like I'm literally have my daughter in the car helping me load like 14 doors that I have to go drop off to somebody's apartment so they, or my apartment so that the painter can paint it. And so I'm delivering all this stuff while I have my daughter, while I'm doing real estate calls, you know, and doing broker to broker calls and trying to train real estate agents and the nightly rental business still isn't a thing. Like um, Airbnb had been out for maybe three or four years. Nobody had really heard of it yet. And then, yeah, I wrote a book. I wrote the, you know, that third book on short-term rentals, not because I really felt like the world needed another book, but because I got tired of answering the same 50 questions over and over. So now this and, is myths, management, and mastery, right? Yeah. Yep. And it's available on Amazon plug. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's available. available everywhere. Or you can go to Worley, uh, WorleyRealEstateNetwork.com and get a copy of it. Thank you. Yes, you can. Um, <laughs> and um, and so, yeah, at that time, 
I launched that book and I was able to just put it in people's hands for free. And the biggest problem that that solved was a lot of people would come to Branson. They would come to the second home location. They were in the ether and they were like, oh, I love real estate. Like, I want to look at more real estate. I'm going to buy something. But then they would go home and then they wouldn't buy anything. You would literally follow up a ton of times and you'd be like, hey, uh, you were so excited when you got here. And they're like, yeah, my kid's in soccer and then my other kid's in gymnastics. And you know, my, I've been sleeping on the couch lately. My wife and I aren't getting along. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, well, okay. Do you still want to buy real estate? And they're like, nah, not really. <laughs> and um, the book, you know, had my beady little eyes on it. It had my picture on it on the cover of the book. And so it was just staring at people when they would just put it on their coffee table or on their nightstand. It was such a thin pamphlet, so easy to read. And I wrote it to inspire people to just get off their butt and do it. And it worked. And my agents were busy. We were so busy. And keep in mind, like once we started having a little bit of success and I saw the power that the short-term rental world could provide to the average Joe investor and to the average real estate agent, I got excited. Like I fell in love with training real estate agents and watching them grow and turn into these like amazing people. They were, we were just growing so fast and it was really now, what What is the time period right now? What, what year is it? Uh, this is 2017. Yeah. So 2017. we're about, we're about three, four, I don't know. I don't do math very well, but this is after the housing crash. This is kind of on the rebound side of it. Oh yeah. Uh, so we have this, uh, we have this housing market crash in 2008 and then we have this sustainable vacation destination market in Branson. Jeremy hones in on the vacation rental and nightly rental market. At the time, we didn't even have those terms necessarily really coined uh, in cement for realtors in the area. And you really started training on what this nightly rental or short-term rental market was. But people were coming to you because of your experience in this nightly rental market business. Yeah, it was. In fact, keep in mind, and, and normally I don't think most people care about dates, but I think it's important in this case for a lot of reasons because of COVID, which we'll mention in just a second. And then also like, keep in mind, all this started in like 2006. So by the time I wrote the book, it was 2016. So I had 10 years of short-term rental experience before I wrote the book on short-term rentals. And the market didn't really start kicking off until 2017, 2018, at which point I had realtors saying to my face, you really timed this right, didn't you? This short-term rental thing. That's what I was getting at. That's what I wanted to talk about because you, I'm not saying that you were lucky. Spending 10 years learning how to master something is not luck. That's effort. That's one foot in front of the other. Yeah. They say, boy, you really timed that right, didn't you? And I was like, yep, I sure did. (laughs) Yeah. And at this time, I was pretty, I was starting to get arrogant. I was starting to get to, get to the point where really we could hit any goal. I mean, we had a legendary team. People are loyal when they're poor, man. It was such a loyal team of people that were just awesome. They're, they're still awesome. But there was just this feeling of all of us coming up together at the same time, which was like like a sports team, you know? Like as freshmen, we were all just like state champs. And then we just got better and better and better, took over the market, became the number one independent firm, like blew past people that were like, where did these guys come from? And- I remember I remember when we were looking at the, uh, what is it, the board of realtors, we're looking at the rankings of the brokerages and Worley, uh, Worley and Associates just kept bumping up on that list of brokerages. And to where it was like butted up against Keller Williams, it was butted up against some of the big na- nationwide brokerages here in the Branson area. And, and our that was exciting. Doing, our, it was. Our agents were doing three and a half times the national average of real estate agents simply because we taught them to work with investors. Yeah. And that's it. And first we taught people, I just sent them on the pathway of the greater return on your time, the same pathway that I had gone through. So first, like you have no idea what you're doing as a real estate agent. Learn to be a world-class realtor fast. I developed a class. I developed a system to help get people there fast. Now you need to become an investor friendly agent. It means you don't own investment property, but you know how to speak the language of an investor and you know how to analyze the first year rate of return on a property. And then now you got three times the product on the shelf that any other real estate agent does. You now have a greater return on your time because if you get 12 investor clients, you're done marketing because they're buying one property a month. That's 12 people buying one property a month. You're busy. You need to scale. And then the next part of that is become an investor yourself. Now you move from being an investor friendly agent to being an investor agent. 
Now you practice what you preach. You have authority. And people come to you in droves because they're like, I want to know what you know. Okay, then- cal- calm down, Tony Robbins. Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, <laughs> what is the ratio of realtors that can survive that that process that you're talking about? I'm not trying to call people out, but I'm saying that people get into real estate for a lot of different reasons, mostly because they want to be their own bosses. So you're telling them to be a world-class agent and then also learn how to deal with investors after that. And then also put your money where your mouth is and buy an investment property at some point. So who's who survives that process in your in your mind? And I'm not saying call people out, but I'm saying like, what type of realtor does it take to go through that three stages and how long? There's a lot of people that want it. I would say 20% of the real estate agents that we talk to want it really, really bad. But either they don't have the commitment level or the, I'd say, brain power. Um, intelligence level to actually analyze investor returns. So um, we either help those people to be great, just real estate agents, or they move on. Um, Is that hard? I mean, is that hard for you as a trainer, as a coach, as somebody that's sewing into these people, bringing them into this world that you know, and then, I don't know, watching them, uh, I don't want to say flake out, but watching them just not achieve what you think they're, or what they're capable of achieving. It's terribly hard for me. Because I want it more than they do most of the time. I still do. I still, like for the leaders on my team now, I still want for them the things that they don't know they need yet, more than they think they need it. So I'm always in this position as a leader, suggesting, suggesting, suggesting. It's like parenting in a way. It's like, hey, you know, you're probably going to want to get a job at some point, (laughs) you know? Um, and they're like, I don't know. I just can't cope with the world and with everything that's going on. And I, you know, I got my future and I got my boyfriend and I got this and, but you're going to have to, I mean, the fact remains, whether they like my opinion as a parent or not, you're going to have to get a job because you're going to need car insurance. You're going to need a car. You're going to want to want to go visit that boyfriend. And we know as parents what they need, but they won't accept it. It's the same thing with me and real estate agents a hundred percent of the time nobody knows what's coming down the pipeline unless there's somebody there. And and there's never been somebody in my life shouting down the pipeline saying, Jeremy, get ready for this. Get ready for this. There is, there is now, God bless it. I finally have people in my life that are doing that, but I had to go join masterminds to go find them. You know, I've been shouting down the pipeline to people for years. And I, I'm not saying that I, I don't know. I don't want to sound like some bleeding heart here because I just care about people so much and I care about the misfits that are underappreciated by the world. And I'm just like, do these things, do these things, grow here, grow here. And at every stage of the way, they fight you every stage of the way, every step of the way. Well, um, uh, one book that you and I really appreciate together is the E-Myth and um, the E-Myth Revisited. And there is a process of going from technician to manager to entrepreneur. And I think there's a, I think it's very clear in your network, the Worley Real Estate Network now, that everybody has to go through that process eventually. They have to move out of technician. They have to move into manager. They have to move into entrepreneur um, to really achieve top level, right? At some point, they have to either, they have to hire the other two. If you're a technician, be a technician and hire a manager and a visionary. If you're a visionary, then hire a manager and a technician. We might cut all this out, but I want to ask you about the growth process of a powerful real estate agent that becomes a team leader. And what are the growing pains and what do they give up to get to that point sometimes? This is the the tale of two real estate agents. And I train both of these agents. One of them is the independent agent that just wants to be independent. And the other one is the one that wants to grow a team. And I've watched this happen and I've listened and coached and nurtured both of these archetypes. Here's what happens. The agent that invests in a team takes their time and their deal flow, and they share percentages of that with their team. They spend a lot of time duplicating themselves by apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is the key in any real estate career. It's not training. You must, if you want to get to where you want to go fast, you must find a team or a firm that is willing to apprentice you. And that's a two to three year commitment where nuance happens. If you don't have nuance, if you don't pick up on somebody's subtle nuances and learn not just how to say, not not just what words to say, but how to say them, 
and in what order to say them and when to use what tactic and when to use what other tactic. And you have somebody who's willing to preach the Sermon on the Mount and then say, turn to their disciples and say, this is why I said it this way. That's the most beautiful form of leadership. That's servant leadership. So when you have somebody who wants to sow into their team, they're going to come to their leader. They're going to come to me and they're going to say, this isn't worth it. This, I'm spending so much time and money on this and I look how much money I could have made and I'm just the responsibility of these people. And I, so that agent said that to me and one year came along and her father-in-law passed away. She was ill a lot of the year and ended up having the best year of her career because her team came around her and ran the business and supported it and took it even to greater heights. Now, the other real estate agent was an independent, a solo agent was making way more money for years. And the team agent would look at the solo agent from time to time and be like, why am I bothering even? Look how much this guy is making. And he's just, he just seems so carefree. But up came a bad year. That person decided to remodel their house and their dad passed away in the same year. That person had the worst financial year of their life because they didn't have a team surrounding them. We don't know what we don't know. We're always unprepared for black swan events. We're always un unprepared for life catastrophes. But when you build a team and when you do life together with like-minded people who just will not let you fail, that's legendary. That's how you build a legendary team. But, it, but, but leadership doesn't necessarily mean happiness or an easy path. You know what I mean? Like when the technician looks at the manager or the entrepreneur, the technician says, oh, well, I could do it so much better. Or they're getting all the benefit of my hard work. Let's be honest. I mean, they don't know the challenges of leadership, the, 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 the bullets that you take the cost that you have to put out there. Um, I'm not saying like we should feel bad for people that are hugely successful, but we should understand that everybody has a different set of challenges, right? Yeah, I would say leadership is definitely a calling. It's, it's a burden, but it's a burden like parenting is a burden. You know, you, you call it a burden because it's something you can't let go of. You can't stop it. There's times, yeah, there's times when um, I'm done. I'm just exhausted. But there's times when I'm just so proud at the tran transitions that I see in people's lives when they come into proximity to our organization and actually have changes. Like I'm, I'm thinking of people right now who are new to our organization, who are struggling and who, like I got to have a conversation with a new agent in my organization today about being an introvert. And it was like, let me help. Let me, my office is near yours. I can see some of the challenges you're having. Let me pop in and ask you a couple questions. And then let me just share some wisdom with you. And if that inspires you and takes you to the next level, let's do that. I get the opportunity to be in proximity to new agents, to new team leads, to people who are like growing. And I love that. It's such a beautiful thing. But at the same time, um, if you, if I don't equip leaders, then I don't get multiplication in my business. I get a savior business model where everybody wants me to be the savior and you try to solve everybody's problems. And ultimately that's what happens to independent brokers that don't learn how to lead. They get dragged under, they get drowned by, you know, emotions and the problems of their independent agents. But if you teach leadership in your organization, you get multiplication. And I teach Christ-centered leadership because I'm looking for servant leaders because I care about their heart. I care about how they're teaching, not just what they're teaching. Let's talk about Worley Real Estate Network. This is the current iteration of this journey that you've been through. And uh, this, inter this iteration has found itself moving away from the uh, independent brokerage. Um, you're with a, a national brokerage now, uh, EXP. Yeah. Um, what was that like to give up this? Because you got a house full of misfits, strongly independent misfits that are doing, I don't, I don't even, I think it was like $280 million in sales on a, for an independent brokerage in Branson, Missouri, right? Like that's a crazy number. And yeah, it's a quarter of a billion. One, yeah, one quarter, quarter of a billion dollars in sales in one year. Yeah. And then you move into this uh, nationwide uh, brokerage. It was hallucination. <laughs> it, it was the belief that I could scale what I did in Branson and other markets. Yeah. And so I don't know. I 
we went from being fiercely independent to me realizing that I needed better systems. Yep. And these companies over here had already developed the systems that I needed. I just needed to plug them in. So well, instead now, of, now let me let me just stop you for a second. Sure. Your systems made you the largest independent broker in Branson, Missouri. So mm -hmm. at this point, you have succeeded, but you hit the glass ceiling for what you were capable of doing in your brokerage. Yeah. So now you're looking outside of your brokerage to how do you scale, right? And yep. you wanted nationwide systems. So let's let's be clear. They were better systems. They were systems that allowed you that scalable ability, right? Correct. Okay. If, if I wanted to buy 80% of my time back, I could align with these brokerages, with, with eXp in my case, and they would do all the brokering and they would do all the accounting. Two major systems that took up a lot of my time and resources, I now automated. And everybody attributed it to me and my decision to align with some corporation. And I, we did no longer had the independent freedoms that we had, but in fact, the independent freedoms that everybody wanted, were gonna have to change anyway, because I was unable to manage the, my standards while I scaled. And so I was getting ready to implement as an independent brokerage, these corporate level standards. Nobody understood that. It made sense to just align with a corporation that had them already. And now I could buy back 80% of my time and go find the 500 people that I haven't met yet that need what I've got for them. We've gone through a lot. We've, we, now you've joined eXp, which is a nationwide brokerage. It's giving you a whole bunch of new tools, processes, training, things like that. Your goal has always been to be a leader and a trainer of ethical uh, realtors, uh, market-focused, and now nationwide what does Worley Real Estate Network now, what's its next stage? What's happening right now with you? What I found about most real estate agents is that they either want to take some high quality photos that look pretty and, and get their significance taken care of because they, they look pretty. They get billboards. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or they really want to learn. Niche specialization is one of the things that gave us an incredible unfair advantage. So yeah, niche specialization is something that I include in the six or seven benchmarks in the pathway from your day one as real estate agent to your real estate career being the thing that launched you into a real estate pathway that you never thought you could actually achieve, like becoming a real estate developer or having replaced your income completely and retire your wife and your family because you've bought enough real estate that you can do that. And you've got teams now in the Worley Real Estate Network that are, they're basically you. I mean, they're you. They're they are Jeremy 2.0 and they've got their own teams that are building and uh, they're bringing on new realtors to their teams. No, no, they're better than me. Oh, they're because, better. Okay. No, they are. That Because they're smarter than me. They've developed better systems than me. I just gave them the environment and the pathway in which to succeed and which with which to get there. Well, that's very and, gracious of you to say, but I think they would say differently, but okay. Well, it doesn't really matter. We're all here together. And so now what I've done is I've created a board of directors within the Worldly Real Estate Network. And I say, you're the leaders that are equipped to handle the incoming flow of people that have their hand up and say, I want what you guys had. Whether they're a seasoned agent or a new agent, like this is the pathway. You have to relearn the pathway. We don't get a lot of seasoned agents because they're not willing for the most part to go back and take off their blue belt or their black belt and put on a white belt. What we have is a dojo. What we have is very specific. I don't run the dojo anymore. The leaders run the dojo and they're better than me because each one is specifically better at that style. Like if, yeah, if they want to learn the dragon, they can come to me. If they want to learn the tiger, they're going to go to somebody else. If they want to learn the stork or the rat or this, I mean, I've developed the whole training program based on Kung Fu for my dojo to be able to equip real estate agents to very, in a very short amount of time, become financially free. And it's been- And really when is that book going to come out, Jeremy? I don't when know. Is the, when is the dojo know. book of real estate? I don't think it ever will. I don't think it ever will. <laughs> because I don't want to say I want to give up on real estate agents, but I want to say I'm very disappointed in their level of commitment to their own career. And the ones that I've had the privilege to sit in front of and talk to and coach and to get to where they want to go, 
like seriously, like I, I've grown the Worldly Real Estate Network to the point where it's self-sufficient and the Lisa Listers and the Dan and Rhonda Fortins and the Kelly Worleys and the Luke Johnston and the Eric Houchins, the Jason Yeagers, these people have gotten to the point where they realize they can build four pillars of income in their career. EXP can help them do two of that with stock and revenue share. Nobody else can do that. If you're an independent broker, you cannot compete with the cloud brokerage, period. You cannot do it. You will never be able to provide stock and revenue share and benefits. So trust me, you're going to keep some people, but you're going to be in a drama fed small fish tank for the rest of your life. If you ever want freedom from that, you will align yourself with a cloud brokerage and you will also teach real estate agents how to invest in real estate. And you don't have to be in a cloud brokerage to learn that from us. We'll literally teach anybody. And I'm just so surprised at people that don't spend the money double down on their education and go for it. I think the problem is, is there's so many stupid, dumbass influencers out there that have raped people for so long off of high ticket items that nobody is willing to pay for them anymore. I'm not willing to teach people for free. I just won't yeah. because I've already determined the type of person that I want to teach. And there's people that I will teach for free, but they're very rare. And I'm usually calling them, talking to them. But even then they're like, who is this guy? I don't care. You know, yeah. it's like, I don't have the Brad Pitt persona to be able to be like, oh, wow. Yeah. Brad Pitt's paying attention to me. He wants me to be this guy. But like, I literally, if people will give me two years of their life, I can turn them into everything they ever want to become because I've done it again and again and again and again. And I haven't figured out how to sell that to people. They got to start at the white belt. And that's well, hard. That's hard for people that a realtor chooses to be a realtor because they don't want to work for somebody else anymore. And this has always been funny to me because what I realized in almost all cases is that once you become a realtor, you end up working for everybody else and usually for, for the, free. For, for the for first free. two, for the first two years. Yeah. And for, and for, for not for free, but for very little return on your time until you learn the processes. One of the first things that ever happened to me when I got my real estate license was I was working with, I was friends with a girl whose brother was a real estate investor. He was in the military and he was investing in real estate. And he goes, I honestly can't see why I would ever use a realtor in my entire life. It offended me, but it had no right to offend me because there's so many, he's right for the most part about so many real estate agents out there. So I endeavored to be that real estate agent in that moment. I endeavored to be that real estate agent that people would be crazy not to do business with. And I still come across real estate investors that are like, ah, I can do it myself. And I'm like, you have, you have no idea how much business you've missed because you haven't done business with me or my team. Because a good real estate agent who's a true fiduciary, who cares about you, the investor, and wants to serve you, can make you a ton of money. Not just by bird dog and good deals, but helping educate you on their market. Dude, I want to just say that... Uh, your life is incredibly inspirational and also at the same time, something that I would probably want to avoid at all costs <laughs> well, because I've watched you suffer, not just through the pains of doing it yourself, putting your money where your mouth is, showing up, painting the doors, remodeling the condos. You and Kelly uh, raising, you know, three wonderful children uh, in this world of real estate and also really sowing into other people that sometimes leave your life. You know what I mean? Like, and I've watched it hurt you and I've watched it inspire you. And I just want to tell you that the ebbs and the flows, the ups and the downs of, of this process with you has been for anybody that's known you for as long as I've known you, uh, you are 100% the inspiration uh, and also the example that people should know this story before they get into real estate. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, I appreciate that. I do. And I want to also credit you for being a confidant for me the whole way. Um, and for actually caring enough about me to check on me at various times. You're one of the few people in my life that I can talk however I want to with you um, and get away with it because 
we're family, you know, I'm yeah. not going anywhere. And you, and I know you're not going anywhere. We're refusing, to, we're refusing to go anywhere. We're refusing to leave each other <laughs> and because we've, I can suffer your beatings and you can suffer mine um, because of that graphic novel. But I would also say this, I'm really glad we had this conversation because I don't want to talk about any of these things ever again. I, I wanted to get them in stone one more time. And I want to start, a new season of Cocktails and Dreams with all of the things that we're doing now. Because what I'm doing now is I'm raising $25 million to start a short-term rental acquisitions fund. I'm going to need real estate agents all over the country. Hopefully they're the ones that I've trained because I know that standard is high. Um, I'm going to be deploying $25 million in the first tranche in short-term rentals. So no, the market is not finished. No, the market is not done. You just need to know how to invest, how to underwrite, which is why I bought a data company, which is why, which is why nobody understands or quite believes it yet. But Virolio is one of the best underwriting tools and time-saving tools that any real estate agent or fund could ever have. I wouldn't have bought the company if it wasn't. I'm going to be proving the concept in that company by creating a real estate fund because I now have access to the lowest performing properties in the top trending markets. Most real estate agents need this data for their investors. Either they're not qualified enough to know they need it yet, or they're too busy to think they know what they need and they won't listen to anyone. So I'm going to go do it myself. I'm going to leave the Worldly Real Estate Network in the capable hands of the leaders who are equipped to help all real estate agents from here on out get a greater return on their time. I get to be a gray-haired guru in this organization and I get the privilege to like be a part of everybody's success and watch people do it and have my office be here while I go deploy tens of millions of dollars in short-term rental acquisitions. There is going to be $51 billion in market cap growth in this industry over the next 10 years, and I'm taking advantage of it. I'm taking high net worth individuals. I've already served the Main Street um, investor. I'm now going to go serve the Wall Street investor and I'm going to go buy tens of millions of dollars of short-term rentals and I'm going to do it the right way. If you want to follow that journey, you will continue listening to this podcast. Um, and that's what I want to talk about from here on out. I want to talk about the luxury real estate developments we're doing. I want to talk about smart term capital and how to raise money and how to get there. Those will be most likely on different channels. Cocktails and Dreams, as you know it, is most likely going to change. Cocktails and Dreams will always be the place where people can share their success stories and their journeys. But I want to start having leadership conversations. I want to start documenting what it's like to start a luxury real estate development. I want to start documenting what it's like to be a general partner in a real estate fund. So if you want to know what those things are going to be like, like stay tuned because this is going to get really, really exciting. And also we want to hear from you. Like this is my opportunity to tell you that I just love to share. I love to be authentic and I love to hear from people. Whether you have a story that you're just dying to tell somewhere, if you are smart, dedicated, professional, and you feel like you're overlooked by the world, I need to meet you. I want to meet you. And this is a platform for your story to be told because you are beautiful and you deserve to be heard. That's what I get to do as an introvert in a long form podcast. Please reach out to us. We want to know who you are. And we've got some really cool ideas for season three of Cocktails and Dreams as we begin to like bring people into the mix to shake this show up a little bit. Now, I'm always going to have the opportunity to muse and to interview those leaders. So if you love leadership, this is still a great avenue for you. If you love real estate, this is still a great avenue for you. If you love entrepreneurship, this is still a great avenue. And if you're a real estate agent, you're going to learn what your career could be someday once you do it at the fullest and, and best level possible. Because if all you're doing is just buying and selling real estate for other people, you're leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars and a life of complete, absolute freedom on the table. So please don't do that. Please listen to these episodes. Please follow us. Please get connected with the really Worldly Real Estate Network and let us help you get a greater return on your time. Holy crap. <laughs> wow. Oh, Tony Robbins, you are just beautiful. <laughs> Take a drink, you sexy beast. I, I love you, dude. I, that's a good sign off. 
Well, a big thank you for listening to the end of our podcast. I know your time is valuable, and I hope you got a few takeaways that are going to help you get a greater return on that time. I know you will. And if you did enjoy it, I'd sure appreciate a share or a comment. Feel free to subscribe for instant access to new episodes and offers. There's also a ton of free content and ways to learn more and engage more at whirlyrealestatenetwork.com. Until then, we'll continue to bring you recipes for success and real stories from real people who, like you, are living out your divine purpose. And hey, God loves you. No matter what happens, don't give up.